that you'll speak through him to us. Pray that you'll bless this meeting and that we can learn whatever you have for us. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. All right. Well, good morning. Good, good to see morning. you in God's house this morning. Good to have Brother Rosado uh, here with us this morning. And and uh, really quick, a uh, uh, couple years ago, uh, we re I received a uh, uh, I don't know if it was a call or or, or uh, was that or an email automated. or something. It's and, automated, yes. And uh, you know about uh, you know from Brother Rosado, and uh, I had never met him, but uh, gave the information about his ministry, about Israel, and and uh, about Bible prophecy, and and uh, Brother Brian had just got done teaching through Bible pro uh, through the Book yeah. of Revelation, and uh, so you know. Uh, we, we, uh, I thought, you know, what do you think about this? You know, and, and brother Brian looked at his website, looked at, you know, uh, we couldn't find anything wrong with him. <laughs> we have sense, but no. <laughs> no. And what I mean about that is that we aligned doctrinally. We, Matt, we, aligned doctrinally. we didn't know, we didn't know him personally, but we aligned doctrinally. And so if he was what he said he was, then, <laughs> then, uh, it was a fit. But he came anyway. He came uh, and had some meetings here and found out that it was a fit. And Praise we're Lord. grateful that the uh, Lord brought us together. And now he's been coming back. You know, he's been, he's come back at least. I think you've been here at least. This is the third time. This is the third time. This is the yeah. third time. Yeah. So Amen. it's good to have him here this morning. Though some of you have not heard him before, uh, but you'll get to hear him today. And I, I know he's going to be a blessing to you. So Praise the Lord, brother. So you come, brother. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Well, good morning. good morning. Hey, it's great to be back with all of you. You know, I'm like a cat. When an independent fundamental Baptist church invites me to speak, then I just keep coming back. Amen. It keeps feeding me. I keep coming back. Uh, but it's a real blessing uh, to be here with all of you this morning. It's Bible Prophecy Sunday. It's the very hot month of August. My month, my name. Amen. And uh, it's just a blessing to be here with all of you. Please pray for my wife, Patty. She is back at the hotel. She's been having one of those those coughing fits uh, all night. I don't know. There's something about Texas. Now, I lived in Corpus Christi for two years as the associate pastor of Brother Lester Roloff's church, People's Baptist Church. And the moment I got into Texas, I don't know if it's in the air, if it's in the soil, if it's in the trees. Something out here just does not agree with me. The sinuses just hit me. The nose starts running coughing. I don't know what it is, but uh, so you got to get all that medication in you. So things are getting a little bit better for me, but Patty is still hacking a lot. She did not want to disturb the service with constant coughing. So please keep her in prayer. She's still uh, in bed and I, I really would uh, appreciate that. But we're here and we're going to learn God's word. We're going to look at current world events in light of biblical prophecy. As the preacher said, I, about three years ago, I sent one of those. It was through dial my calls. It's an automated system. So you just, you know, do the recording, send it out. I sent it out to, I think about maybe 50 or so independent fundamental King James only Baptist churches. And the only fundamental Baptist church to respond, brother Brian, was you guys, was pastor. And I was absolutely tickled pink 
that he would call me and say, just come on down, brother, and, you know, preach to our people. And yes, we are aligned doctrinally. Amen. We have the same Bible. We have the same doctrine. Amen. And we believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon. How many of you believe that? Jesus Christ is coming soon. And you know something? It could even be today. That's the reason why I'm glad Brother Brian was, you know, he, he taught on the book of Revelation. So you have that foundation, amen? But I think it's very important that we look at Bible prophecy for its plain sense interpretation. It doesn't need my help, Brother Brian. I need its help, amen? I need to study God's word because the Bible is its best own interpreter, especially when we read the book of Daniel. And we're going to be looking at the book of Daniel this morning. The book of Revelation. You can't really understand the one without the other. And you're going to run into a whole lot of symbolism in the book of Daniel, in the book of Revelation. But here's the key. You must look for a literal interpretation behind all that symbolism. Now, question. This is Sunday school. Who will interpret those symbols for you? Me or the word of God? Absolutely. The word of God will interpret those symbols for you. And you'll see how everything falls into place. So we're going to be looking uh, briefly this morning at the prophetic outline of eschatology. What does eschatology mean? Don't let that word scare you off. It's a fancy theological word that simply means the doctrine of last things. The doctrine of the end times. Now, I'm convinced, preacher, that we are living in the last days. And when you read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, between those verses, 1 through 5, you will count, you will circle 19 characteristics of what you and I are right now witnessing in these last days prior to the next main event we call the rapture of the church. We have been in the last days for almost 2,000 years. Well, 2,000. So what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. Is it getting any better? I mean, you see what's going on in the world. You, you watch the news if you can stomach it. Uh, you read the newspaper. You see what's going on. You see what's going on in Israel. I just got back from Israel three weeks ago. My 34th trip out there. I'm going back, Lord willing, in October. You see what's going on in Israel. You see what's going on in the Middle East. You see what's going on around the world. And folks, I'm here to tell you. Now, what we see going on in the world, it's in lockstep with what Bible prophecy says will happen in the very last of the last days. So you look at all those 19 characteristics. Paul said this. He said, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. Are you convinced we're living in those perilous times right now? Absolutely. And then I took my pen out, Brother Brian, and I circled. I counted and I recounted, <laughs> and I came up with the same number, one nine, 19 characteristics. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. They hate our guts. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Do we not see that going on right now? But <clears throat> here's the clincher. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, what are we to do? Turn away, the Bible says. You don't let a cancer, a spiritual cancer, walk through those doors to have somebody come in here and to undermine the authority of the man of God. Preacher, you know I preach all across these United States. And I sit down in the office of pastors and the things they tell me make the hair of my arms stand up. And you would think that this is coming from unbelievers. These attacks are not coming from without. They're coming from within. They're undermining the authority of the man of God and they're sowing division amongst God's people to undermine and to embarrass the man of God. Do you remember those seven deadly sins in the book of Proverbs? God says, I hate these six 
But this seventh one sticks in my craw. And you know what God calls that seventh one? An abomination. He said, these six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imagination, feet that be swift to run in mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies. And here's the seventh one. He that soweth discord among brethren. That's what we see. That's what I see. When I speak at churches, all it's, it's, folks, it's part of the last day's scenario. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming sooner rather than later. I believe the players are getting into position. And I believe the curtain is about to go up on the end time drama. When the church is taken out of here at the rapture, when we hear the sound of a trumpet, a shofar, and the church is taken out, somewhere down the line, somewhere down the road, the ruler from the revived Roman Empire will come on the world stage and he will confirm the covenant with many for how many weeks? One week, which is seven years. It is, that's seven years. That one week is a final seven-year period of tribulation because we know 69 of those 70 weeks have already been fulfilled. You know, when I go to Israel, and I share the gospel with Jews and Arabs out there. The argument that I encounter amongst Jews and especially the rabbis is the Messiah is yet to come. <clears throat> now, you Christians, you already have your Messiah. We're waiting for our Messiah. And then I counter by saying, well, if he's, if he's not the Messiah for the Jews, he can't be the Messiah for the Christians either. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I said, the Messiah has come. And all you have to do is read Daniel 9, 24 through 27, where it clearly tells us after three score and two weeks or 69 weeks, what happens to the Messiah? He is cut off. The Messiah is put to death. That's what Daniel said. The Mashiach in Hebrew, the Messiah is put to death. The death of Jesus Christ ended the 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. From Nehemiah, chapter 2, 445 B.C., to the death of the Messiah, 30 A.D. One week remains unfulfilled. That's still future. And what is that one week? A seven-year period of tribulation to come. I want to... Uh, invite you to take your Bibles. Actually, I got the wrong one over here. I didn't want to get the... I want to take your Bibles. Go to Revelation chapter number one, please. Revelation chapter number one. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number one, and I know you're very familiar with this. If anybody tells you, you know, keep prophecy where it belongs in the future. Don't bother yourself with the study of Bible prophecy. I'm here to tell you they're contradicting God's word. Okay, we should not. I have Christians at time, they come up to me and they say, well, Brother August, Bible prophecy scares me. I, I, I can't read the book of Daniel. I, I can't read the book of Revelation. I'm just terrified. Listen, if you're saved, one day Bible prophecy <clears throat> will be your blessed hope. If you're not saved, one day Bible prophecy will be a holy terror. Because you will be left behind at this event we call the rapture, to go through that terrible, unprecedented seven-year period of tribulation. So it only makes sense to get saved in the here and now. Avoid what is to come. You think it's bad now? Listen to me, church. This is a cakewalk compared to what is to come. Notice with me in Revelation chapter 1, and looking at verse number 1. And you will notice the fourfold communication <clears throat> of how John the Apostle got this revelation. It says in Revelation uh, chapter 1 and uh, verse number 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Here's verse 3. Blessed, you might want to circle that one. Blessed is he that 
readeth, that's your eye gate right there, readeth, and they that hear, that's your ear gate, the words of this prophecy, and keep, keep in your heart, keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house on your Lord's day. On this very day, Lord, as we gather together as born-again believers to worship you and to magnify and glorify your holy and righteous name. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be back at Gatewood Baptist Church, to see all of our friends again, and Pastor Moreno, Brother Brian, and everyone here, Lord. And Father, it's my prayer today uh, that the word of God will go forth, that we will hear from heaven and from the very heart of God. And Lord, if there is someone here this morning and they do not have the assurance of going to heaven when they die, it's my prayer, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would, by faith, call upon the name of the Lord, be born again through the Spirit of God, and be ready <clears throat> for either one or two things, either death or the next main event we call the rapture of the church. And so, Father, help us to be attentive this morning. Uh, remove all distractions and obstacles. Be with Patty, Lord. And I'm just praying, dear Father, that you would give her grace, strengthen her, help her to overcome this head cold, uh, these sinuses, dear Lord. And may you be glorified in everything that's said and done. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, amen and amen. This past May, I took a tour group for the first time over to Greece. I've never been to Greece before. And people kept on calling me saying, Brother Rosado, why don't we just take a tour to Greece? Go to Israel in the fall. I said, you know, I've never been to Greece. That would be a good opportunity. And so we ended up going to Greece. We ended up taking a flight to a small island mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 14, called Samos. And that's where Paul the Apostle spent the night on Samos. So we spent the night on Samos. Following day, we get on a speedboat and we sailed for about two and a half hours to the Isle of Patmos. I was absolutely tickled pink, brother. That, that's been on my bucket list for years, to visit the Isle of Patmos, where 2,000 years ago, John the Apostle was imprisoned on that very island. He was a prisoner of the Roman Empire. What was John's crime? He's preaching that there's only one king, and it ain't Caesar. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and that's Jesus Christ. Well, John was arrested probably at Ephesus, where Paul founded the church at Ephesus, Acts chapter 19. Paul dies. John takes over that ministry over there. He's arrested by the Roman authorities. He's taken over to the Isle of Patmos, where Jesus Christ revealed to him the revelation. Now, it's not revelations, <laughs> plural. I have, well, brother is out of revelations. It's not revelations in the plural. It's revelation, singular. And it should never be referred to as the revelation of St. John the divine. John was not divine. John was a sinner like you and I in need of a savior, amen? So it should never be referred to as the revelation of St. John the Divine. The only one who's divine in the book of Revelation is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. So as we look at the fourfold communication here, this revelation came from God the Father to God the Son through an angel and then finally to who? John the Apostle who penned down the book of the Revelation. So in this prophetic outline, briefly this morning, uh, we're going to look at the four major trends of Bible prophecy. Then we're going to be looking at the four apocalyptic books of Bible prophecy, and we will look at the prophetic trio of triplets according to Bible prophecy. So I would recommend this morning, since this is Sunday school, 
If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. We'll try to answer uh, that question for you. But um, I would suggest that you take notes, amen? Write down notes and go over those notes uh, later on. Study these things on your own personal time, your devotions, your personal studies, and so on and so forth. So that way we can have a, a, a firm grasp on Bible prophecy because Bible prophecy is one of the most abused doctrines, Brother Brian, out there in the church today. It's abused. It's misused, leading to people becoming confused. We don't need that, amen? We just need the plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy. And that, that, that's such a travesty today to see an unprecedented abuse of Bible prophecy amongst those within uh, the church. And again, I must reiterate, the Bible is its best own interpreter. We must compare Scripture with Scripture in order to ascertain more information. Why? If the plain sense makes sense, don't look for any other sense, or you will end up with nonsense. And when it comes to Bible prophecy, folks, there is a lot of nonsense that's out there today. So let's, let's dive right into it. Let me just show some really good, good facts here. Bible prophecy takes up at least one-fourth of the Word of God. Out of the Bible's 31,124 verses, 8,352 of those Bible verses include prophetic predictions. That's why it's important that we study God's Word, especially Bible prophecy. Why? It's our blessed hope. Amen? Now, in the New Testament, one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament deal with future world events. That's why we are told, again, in Revelation 1-3, blessed, amen, fortunate, blessed is he that readeth, they that hear the words of his prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. If John could make that comment 2,000 years ago on the Isle of Patmos, that the time is at hand, no doubt he expected Jesus to return during his lifetime, amen? 2,000 years later, how close can his coming be? Another very interesting fact, Bible prophecy is at least 33% of Scripture. From Daniel chapter 1 to Revelation chapter number 22 is about 400 of the 1,189 chapters of the Bible that deal with Bible prophecy. So don't let anybody tell you, don't waste your time studying prophecy. That goes against the Word of God, amen? That's the reason why we need to dig into God's Word every single day. That's why Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.15, study, amen, brother? That's a dirty word in the church today. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it would behoove us, ladies and gentlemen, to dig into God's word every single The moment you wake up, get into God's word, man. Study, so that way you'll be ready to give an answer. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 tells us why. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. I love that word, inspiration. It comes from the Greek word, theos, nusos, which simply means God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So from the book of Daniel, chapter 1, to Revelation 22 is 400. That's a lot, man. 400 of the 1,189 chapters of the Bible that deal with Bible prophecy. Now, let's look at those four main trends of Bible prophecy, and we're going to use alliteration. That just means words that begin with the same letter. A in this case, okay? We're going to look at the four main trends of Bible prophecy. The first trend would be Aliyah. Everyone say Aliyah. Aliyah. Now you're speaking Hebrew. Ivrit. Hebrew. 
Aliyah simply means to ascend or to go up. And that's what they did in biblical times. The Jewish people had to make Aliyah ascend up to Jerusalem three times a year for three of the main Jewish feasts, according to Deuteronomy 16, verse number 16. The spring feast, Passover, Jews were required to be in Jerusalem by God. Summer feast, Pentecost, Jews were required to be in Jerusalem. That's why we read Acts chapter 2, right? It was at Pentecost where? Took place in Jerusalem. Jews from all over were there. And then the fall feast would be the Feast of Tabernacles. Jews were required to be there in Jerusalem for three out of those seven feasts in Leviticus chapter number 23. Now today, the Israeli government uses Aliyah to refer to Jewish immigration back to the land of Israel. And folks, that's what Ezekiel 37 is all about. You remember Ezekiel 37, right? Them bones and bones them dry bones and bones and bones. The dry bones. God says, Ezekiel, Ben Adam, son of man, come here. Yes, Lord, look into the valley. What do you see? Ooh, bones, skulls, skeletons. What's up with that, Lord? God looks at Ezekiel and he says, son of man, can these bones live? And I love Ezekiel's response. Lord, thou knowest. And then he says in Ezekiel 37, 11, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. In other words, the bones represent the Jews dried up, scattered to the four corners of the earth. The graves represent the nations they have been scattered to. All of a sudden, Ezekiel hears, he's hearing the shaking, he's hearing the rattling, bone against bone. Then he sees the flesh, the tissue, the muscle coming on these skeletons. And then God breathes life into them. They stand up and they become an exceeding great army. I can't set a day for the rapture, Brother Brian, because that's unbiblical. But I do have a date as to when Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled. Are you ready for that date? May 14th, 1948. After 2,000 years of being dispersed to the four corners of the earth, after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple, the Jews were scattered, being persecuted and killed, wandering from nation to nation. After 2,000 years, they're back in their own homeland. I was at Independence Hall in Tel Aviv where that prophecy came into fruition. Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, stood right in front of that. Everything in that Independence Hall, everything's still original from 1948. The microphone, the seats, everything. He stood behind that podium, 400 reporters in attendance. And he spoke only 997 words in only 17 minutes time. You know what he stated to the world? We declare to the world as foretold by our Jewish prophets, the rebirth of the state of Israel. Are them bones and bones and dry bones fulfilled May 14th, 1948. And even today, Aliyah, Jews are still making Aliyah to the land of Israel. Second trend, alignment of the nations. Nations that are now getting into position to attack the Jewish state of Israel. That would be Ezekiel 38, 39. When Russia leads an Arab coalition of nations to attack the Jewish state of Israel. Ezekiel 38, 39 records nations that do not share a common border with Israel. However, when you read Psalm 83 and that Arab attack on Israel, those are Arab nations who do share a common border with the state of Israel. And um, parallel to Ezekiel 38 would be Daniel 11, 40 through 45. So we have Aliyah, Jewish people are still coming back to the land, alignment of the nations, nations getting into position to attack the Jewish people. And then look at this, anticipation of peace. When I share the gospel with Jews in Israel, that I get this all the time. All we want is peace. We want to live peaceably among our Arab neighbors. We just want our Arab neighbors to accept us as peace-loving Jews. And then I say, well, do you think that's actually going to happen? No, but we'd like it to. <laughs> we just want peace. We'll do anything for peace. I know you will. 
Because Bible prophecy tells me that's exactly what you're going to do. When the ruler from the revived Roman Empire in Daniel 9, 27 confirms the covenant with many for one week. As you said, brother, that one week is that final seven-year period of tribulation. I had a guy challenge me one time, and he says, um, he goes, oh, that week in Daniel 9, 27, that's not referring to seven years. That's only referring to three and a half years. I'm like, sir, you're wrong. I said, that's why you must apply scripture with scripture, amen? I said, you compare Daniel 9, 27 with Genesis 27, 29, where Jacob was working for Uncle Laban and he fell in love with Rachel. He says, I want her to be my wife. And he works for her and he works and he works years for her. But instead of getting Rachel, he ends up getting Leah. So he got the seed by Uncle Laban. Uncle Laban, why did you deceive me? Did I not work for Rachel? Why did you give me Leah? And Uncle Laban said this, if you want Rachel, you must fulfill her week and work another seven years. It's the same Hebrew word in Genesis 27, 29 that we find in Daniel 9, 27, Shavuah. And it refers to seven, a number of seven. In this case, that will be seven years. So we have anticipation of peace. That will happen sometime after the church is taken out of here at the rapture. And then look at this, arrangements for the rebuilding of the third Jewish temple. If you come on one of our future Bible prophecy tours to Israel, and I hope you do, I'm going to take you to the Temple Institute where they're making all the preparations for the rebuilding of a third Jewish temple. They just notified me at the Temple Institute in the old city of Jerusalem. They sent me an email stating that they now have in their possession a pure, red, female cow. Para, as they say in Hebrew. Now, they have many red heifers, but for some reason, these, these ones are not working out. Now they're telling me that they have in their possession a red heifer to meet all the requirements of Numbers chapter 19. And they tell us at the Temple Institute, when that third temple is up and running, they're going to sacrifice that red cow. They will reinstitute animal sacrifices. And that goes right along with Daniel 9, 27. That goes right along with what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15. That goes right along with what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, and Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, that there will be in the tribulation on the Temple Mount a third Jewish temple. Many call it the Temple of the Antichrist. Others call it the Tribulation Temple. Take your pick. It will stand on the most sacred piece of real estate on earth today. And that will be the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The Temple Mount that the Jews call in Hebrew, Har Harbayit, Hill of the House. Well, Temple Mount, that takes you back to Genesis 22. That's where Abraham takes Isaac for sacrifice. It was right there, Mount Moriah. Today, the Temple Mount, that's the same place where David purchases the threshing floor from Aruna, the Jebusite, that would pave the way for David's son Solomon, 2 Chronicles 3.1, to build the temple on Mount Moriah. That would be the Temple Mount. Solomon's temple stood there for 400 years. Herod's temple in the time of Jesus stood there for 600 years. In the future, there'll be a third Jewish temple. Let me ask you a question. What structure occupies that site right now? What structure occupies the Temple Mount right now? The Dome of the Rock. It sits right on the historical locations where Solomon and Herod's Temple stood. That's got to go. How? I don't know, but it's got to go. In order for a third Jewish temple to stand on the most sacred piece of real estate on earth today. Now we'll look at four main books of uh, Bible prophecy. Now, the first one would be Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a timeline for the Jewish people. God's program for the Jewish people in the not-too-distant future. Ezekiel 
was the prophet during the Babylonian exile. He was taken in 597 BC by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army, taken along with 10,000 other Jews to Babylon for that 70 year period. Ezekiel is a timeline for the Jewish people, God's program for the Jewish people in the not too distant future. But before Ezekiel was taken in 597 BC, Daniel, the book of Daniel, is a timeline for the Gentiles. Who are Gentiles? There you go, you, <laughs> the non Jews, right? Daniel was taken in 605 BC to Babylon. Daniel and Ezekiel were the Jewish prophets of the Babylonian exile. They prophesied during the Babylonian exile. Daniel was taken in 605 BC and then Ezekiel in 597. Daniel was taken 605 BC along with his three Jewish buddies. Do you remember their names? Okay. Right, that's what the Bible calls them, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Let me ask you a question. This is Sunday school. So feel free to interject, okay? Who gave those three Jewish boys those names? It was Nebuchadnezzar. Those names didn't come from God. Why did Nebuchadnezzar give these three Jewish boys those names? An attempt at brainwashing. You're not going to worship who you think is your true God. You're going to start worshiping my God. So Daniel, I know your name in Hebrew means God is my judge, but now I'm going to change your name to Belshazzar. Bel is my God. So you're going to start worshiping Bel. B-E-L. Now Daniel's three Jewish friends were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I think we should start calling them by their godly Hebrew names. Hananiah, well, your name in Hebrew means God is gracious, but I'm going to change it to Shadrach, inspiration of the sun. You're going to worship the sun, S-U-N. Mishael, your name in Hebrew means God is without equal, but I'm going to change your name to Meshach, belonging to Aku. You're going to start worshiping my pagan god, Aku. Azariah? Your name means the Lord is my helper in Hebrew, but I'm going to change it to Abednego, servant of Nego. You're going to start worshiping Nego. It was an attempt to strip these Jewish men of the worship of the one true God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I just wanted to throw that out there. So Ezekiel, timeline for the Jews. Daniel, a timeline for the Gentile. Here's the third one, Zechariah. Zechariah records the second coming, not the rapture, the second coming of Jesus Christ back to this earth. He has so much to say concerning the second coming. The main passage out of the 14 chapters in the book of Zechariah is Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2. When Jesus returns at the end of the seven-year period of tribulation, at his second coming, he comes back to Jerusalem and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives. I love going to the Mount of Olives, brother, when I take my tour groups to Jerusalem. It was from the Mount of Olives. He gave the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24. He gives his disciples a, a preview of end-time events. But it was also from the Mount of Olives he ascended back up into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. When I was at my hotel three weeks ago, the Dan Hotel in Jerusalem, I walk out into my balcony, brother, sat on the chair on the patio, and guess what I'm staring at right in front of my face? The Mount of Olives. There's a big, tall church on there called the Church of the Ascension, where they believe that was the area Jesus ascended back up into heaven. And at a second coming, Zechariah 14, 4 says, And on that day shall his feet stand upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, which is why you have thousands of Jewish graves on the Mount of Olives. Thousands in anticipation of that verse there, Zechariah 14, 4. And then Revelation, a timeline for who? You. <laughs> a timeline for Christians. The late Dr. Jimmy DeYoung believed that the rapture might possibly happen between Revelation chapter 4, 1, Revelation chapter 4, and verse number 2. And we know that the church is only mentioned 25 times in the book of Revelation. 
19 times before Revelation 4.2. This is way before the tribulation begins. And then another six times after Revelation 19.11. This is way after the tribulation period ends. What's my point? In between chapters 6 through 19 that cover that seven-year period, there is no mention, Brother Brian, of the church being on the earth. Oh, wait a minute, August. It talks about saints on the earth. Are we not saints? Yeah, we are saints. But what saint are you talking about? Are you talking about church age saints? Are you talking about Old Testament saints? Are you talking about tribulation saints? Well, we're in the church age right now, are we not? I got saved during the church age, so that makes me a what? Church age saint. Anybody who gets saved after the rapture and they're in the tribulation period, were they a part of the church age? No, but they got saved during the tribulation period. That makes them what? Tribulation saints. Those are the saints talked about, not only in the book of Daniel, but also in the book of Revelation. It's those same ones that the Antichrist will seek to annihilate during the final 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. But there's no mention of, you know who's missing on planet Earth during the tribulation period? C-H-U-R-C-H. We're gone. We are out of here, amen? We are up in heaven. So we got Ezekiel, timeline for the Jews. Daniel, timeline for the Gentiles. Revelation, timeline for Christians. Zechariah, referring to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, we only got a few minutes here. Three main strands of the human family. This is how God divides humanity today. And he has a plan for all three strands of the human family. The first strand of the human family would be the Gentiles. Before you had Jews, before you had Christians, all you had on the earth were Gentiles. Goyim in Hebrew. For the first 2,000 years of human history, from Genesis 1 through, uh, through uh, Genesis chapter 11, all you had on the earth were Gentiles. Up until you get to the second strand of the human family, and that would be from Genesis chapter 12 to Acts chapter 1, with the call of Abram from Ur of the Chaldees in the area of what is today southern Iraq. The second strand of the human family comes into existence, that would be the Jewish people. From Acts, uh, Genesis 12, all the way to Acts chapter number 1. And then we have the third strand of the human family coming into existence. And that was established in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. This would be the birth of the church from Acts chapter 2 going all the way to Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 2. This is how God divides humanity today. You remember what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 32? Give none offense to the Jew, Gentile, church of God. Unbelieving Gentile, unbelieving Jews, born again Jews and Gentiles that make up what is today the church. This is how God divides humanity. The book of Revelation, 22 chapters containing 400 verses. And again, folks, the church is only mentioned 25 times in the book of Revelation, but never in between chapters 6 through 19 that cover the seven-year period of tribulation. So, of course, it was kind of windy that day, so my hair is all wild. And brother, that's Dr. Todd Baker. I think you remember Todd when he was here a few years ago. And uh, we are right on the Isle of Patmos. And you can go to my YouTube channel, subscribe to my YouTube channel. And uh, we're right on the Isle of Patmos as we are teaching the book of Revelation, where John was exiled some 2,000 years ago. Some would try to say, well, the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the year 70 AD. That's what the predators would try to cram down your throat. But we have ancient sources like Irenaeus over here who said that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos during the reign of Domitian. And Domitian reigned between uh, 81 and 96 AD. So John the Apostle wrote that book be somewhere between 90 and 96 AD. So I am a futurist not a preterist. I don't believe the book of Revelation was already fulfilled with the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. That's hogwash. The book of Revelation is still future. The only thing that I can say that is historical about the book of Revelation would be the seven 
churches between Revelation chapter 2 and chapter number 3. The rest of the book from 4 through 22 is still future. Amen? It's still future. Since the Roman destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Jews were scattered to the four corners of the earth, but now they are back in the land. They, make, they made Aliyah back to the land of Israel. Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled May 14th of 1948. They're back in the land, but they're back in unbelief. They still reject Jesus as a Messiah in preparation for that final seven-year period of tribulation to come. What am I telling you, folks? The stage is being set. Actors are getting into position. The curtain is about to go up on the end-time drama. Now, if you know me, when I go to churches, I love to toot my own horn. You know what I'm talking about here, right? For those of you that have seen me here before. That's why I bring my shofar. That's a Hebrew word. Everyone say shofar. Shofar so good, your Hebrew's getting better, amen? <laughs> I bought this baby in Israel in 2010. One day a trumpet's going to sound, and it's going to be so loud, all the born-again dead in Christ will rise for us. And then we, which are alive and remain, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord, and yet we are told to comfort one another with these words. How do you know the shofar is a trumpet in the Bible? Well, I have a King James Bible here, brother. I got the word of God right here in front of my face. And I've read Joshua chapter 6, verses 4, 5, 6, 8, 13. Five times it says the priest, the Kohen Hagadol, blew the trumpet of ram's horns. This is a Yemenite shofar. I think we might have a few of the biblical ram's horns that just got back from um, Israel. Those are biblical trumpets. And when they sound, it will be so loud, all the born again dead in Christ and Christians alive at the time of the rapture will be caught up to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in the air. The rapture, Jesus is coming soon. No signs preceded and no prophecies have to be fulfilled. Keep your ear hole on. Keep looking up and pray Maranatha. <laughs> Faster than you can blink a human eye. Poof. We're gone. Or as the umpire would say, you're out. We're out of here. Amen. And he's going to take us to the Father's house. Help me. And when he takes us to heaven, we will be there for a very brief seven years. While the earth below is going through a what? Seven-year period of tribulation. If you don't get right, you're going to get left. Don't be left behind. Get saved now. Father, thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to teach your word. I pray that what was said uh, this morning, dear Lord, that we would apply, that it would resonate with us and Find a place in our hearts, dear Lord. And Lord, if there is someone here this morning and they do not have that assurance of going to heaven when they die, I pray that they would take care of that, Lord, that they would uh, receive your free gift of eternal life and by faith call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Father, thank you for what you're about to do now. Bless the uh, morning service at 11 a.m. And uh, we pray that you will be done. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. Any, any comments or any questions?